Hi there. Okay, I know there's, there's some background noise from the traffic outside, but it's a uh, well uh, beginning of September, and the weather is foggy and a little bit rainy there. But anyway, I want to talk to you about a little bit of the work I do, which is called RBIM or Realization Behavior Integration Model. Some people might also you know what what is it and all that. It's, well, complicated, as you like to say. Uh, anyway, I was going to talk to you today about a little bit about, you know, a hero's painful experience, something like that, or journey, or whatever you call it. You see, whenever people talk about uh, what's good, the bad, right, the wrong, and stuff like that, right? So, okay. Uh, that's because we have, you know, consciousness, because the brain has a function, the basic functions of the brain, that's true the evolution of uh, the brain evolution and consciousness and body, mind, all that stuff. So we have basic functions of how the brain works and the body works, right? Then we have how it works, or that's when we have what we call adding consciousness, because how, it, how the brain works it's not just about the function of the brain, but also how it's used. And how you use the brain creates uh, what we call an RBIM for a comparison mode. That means we are comparing things all the time. And it's all about depending on your focus of attention, awareness, intention, stuff like that, to create you know, the desired position. Some people say, and people go, like, what do you mean by position? Well, how you relate to the reality you're engaging to. People are, the reality I'm engaging to. You know, I'm gonna get married or something like that? No, no, it's not about that. It's a little bit more complicated. If you look, for example, about the hero's yearn and stuff like that, you know, uh, let's take a classic example, Star Wars, right? Luke Skywalker, uh, his uh, kid, he's dreaming or you know, stuff like that, to go out in the universe and fight for the rebels and all that because they want to fight the bad guys. And when he gets the opportunity, the chance to do so, he, you know, doesn't want to go out there and follow, you know, the big guy, but he wants to go home and, you know, take care of his parents and all that. Because that's what, what, what's the kind of stuff, the story that tells you. That you're more comfortable, or comfort zone, whatever people are. And even if you have a desire, a hope, or dreams and all that stuff, you're not so likely to go out in the world, you know, and do something new. You'd rather stay at home, save the sun, before, you know, something bad might happen. This leads me into uh, physiotherapy. You know, uh, I have one of my students in down under in New Zealand, Australia stuff, you know, countries down under for me, because in, in Australia, uh, for me, if I could look down through the earth, they would be, I would see the feet and the head would be on the, you know, pointed right down. Uh, and we don't perceive it that way. Obviously when we travel to Australia or New Zealand or something like that. However, once we, you know, using the water sink, we, we notice that the water travels the other direction than it does on this hemisphere. Which is pretty amazing if you ask me. Anyway. Steve is doing physiotherapy, he's a physiotherapist, and he works with mobility. What, what do you mean by that? Well, if you have a pain in your shoulder, you, the, the body's normal reaction is to protect. If you have something, you pay, oh, I, I can't use that one. The muscle will start to contract and to try to protect your shoulder. If you strain an ankle, you know, if you have, a, you know, internal, you know, kidney pain, stuff like that, people go, oh, I don't want to, you know, you know, don't want to put pressure on that, right? After a while, your body is adapt to that kind of position. This is what the body on the brain is doing. It's always adapting to something. So if you have a pain shoulder, most people when they go to a therapist, physiotherapy, uh, something like that, massage, uh, whatever, they, they expect you to work on the shoulder because this is where the pain is, right? So what Steve is doing, he's working with other shoulder, increasing the mobility in that shoulder and all that. And sooner or later, the mobility here starts to increase and the pain goes away which the client, when they're sitting there, expecting him to work on the pain, and he's not working on the pain, he's working, because there's other technologies out there that's coming you know, to this kind of conclusion that if you do that, the cross hemispheric stuff like that, transfer, right, and you get better. So the pain goes away. 
And this is why the Scott Sonnen Interflow system is great also. I'm using that kind of system for myself for about a year and a half now. Scott Sonnen is the Interflow. And it's a mobility exercise as you do, so you can, you know, be, you know, touchy-like in your actions. You're increasing your joint flow and pressure, and also the, how the muscle tissue is connected to your joints and all the stuff, to so increase your mobility. That means if you have headaches, or uh, you have a rheumatoid disease, or uh, infl inflammatory problems in your muscle tissues and all that stuff, Interflow will save your life, basically, because it will increase the flow it will deal with uh, tension, it will deal with all, anything you know, the body produces in that way, so you get a lot more, more response potential, right? So you can respond more effectively to the life you're living. So, you know, right. And so this is the principle, the principle is that you work with the side that works fine, so you can understand how that, you know, because that focus of retention there. And this goes back to the right and wrong things, like good or bad, or you know, stuff like that. Because uh, the human brain and the function is, 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 is basically a triangle. You know, you have something you start from, and then it goes up like this, you know, triangle-like. And when that happens, you create in the triangle, you have two, two sides here. That creates a comparison. So depending on where your focus is, most people assume this is unconscious, by the way, because the brain's function is about to, when you start to learn that this is contextual, so you have a, establish a context. Within that context, the brain knows what to do and how to behave or to how to respond in that context. And there is an intermittent uh, interaction between what was going totally inside and totally, you know, in, interacting with the environment or what people can normally call outside, right? And when I'm working with people, uh, as with RBIM, I ask them, you know, how the future going to be. Let's say they have an anxiety they worry about, right? So they have a little feeling about something going to go wrong, and this is amplified sooner or later, and they go like, oh my god! Because the brain is starting to you know, create scenarios, because that's what the brain does. It doesn't control the input. It just amplifies it and do more of the dealing with the process, right? So people go like, oh no, I can't, you know, and they start worrying and, and they, they just, uh, you know, tend to, you know, they get really paranoid sooner or later because something bad is going to happen. You know it, but it's all in terms of the brain, then, right? And uh, working with those, you can ultimately, oh, well, what happens if you have a day when it just works? You know, you have a day when it just works and you feel fine for, uh, for you know, have a perfect day, more like, you have a perfect day, ah, that's not possible because I can't have that. And they go, like, well, maybe, let's find out how that. Well, I can't have it. So if you can't have it, you know, you can talk about it, you can, you know, uh, elicit it, you can find out what it is like, you know, and they go, like, yeah, you can do that, but, you know, you can't have it. Obviously. Mm -hmm. So you elicit that, and what happens is you get a new trend, you, know, you get a new comparison, and you get a new focus point, right? So after a while, the focus on, you know, the good shoulder. So when I'm talking to people when they have an uh, illness or a disease or something like that, and they, I tell them, okay, focus on the good shoulder, focus on that, and I'm going, okay. And I have worked with uh, people who have multiple sclerosis, I have multiple people who have, you know, rheumatoid diseases. And, uh, you know, I had this guy, uh, his wife brought him uh, to the workshop, and um, I think that's what the wife is supposed to do, you know, bring the guys over, you know. You have to meet this guy, and he was like, well, "Why should I go to this class? You know, this you." you know. Anyway, she brought him. He had uh, best ref uh, disease. Uh, I think they renamed it something else. It's rheumatoid disease. Yes, I had it for 20 years. So I asked him about it, and he said, "Well, I get pain in my, you know, in my hips." And he pointed to his back. We should say that's the first mistake you did. That that's not your hip. Your hips is down, you know, in your legs, not in the back. So he made a mistake, and I helped him redirect that kind of starting point. So he went from having, uh, he, they, they couldn't go on the vacation because of the two days he maybe got, you know, oh, my, my body hurts so bad and he couldn't, you know, function. So they had to go home, ruin the vacation. Fun was that. You know, what happens is that he could stop taking medication. His body, you know, in some way got a lot better. And he, they are able to go to vacation for two or three weeks with no problems. And he 
you know, his life is you know, turn around, stuff like that. That's kind of cool if you ask me. Um, so a lot of people think, you know, becoming a hero is, is, is basically becoming a hero is to understand that you don't want to change your comfort zone. You don't want to altering whatever's going on in your life right now. That's, you don't want to do that. Because if you did want to do that, you already be doing that. But since you're probably listening to this, watching this, or uh, you know, studying NLP, uh, self-help books, uh, listen to you know, there's a lot of people who do Tony Robbins, for example. Tony Robbins is is very keen on using pain to move people away. Oh, I don't want to have that. And this, if you talk about the body and the shoulder here, right? So if you focus on the pain and moving away from the pain, what's you focus on? It's on the pain. It's not what whatever is going to happen. So you have to use that kind of approach again and again and again. Richard Mandel used propulsion system the same way, focusing on the gauge and then try to move away. Right? And uh, this guy Joseph Riccio, he, he learned something from Roy Fraser. Roy Fraser was a guy back in the day who asked a different kind of question about how the iconic experience or how you actually know things. And it's a, it's a different philosophy than probably one. But my take on this is very simple. That you have a starting point in the function of your brain. Then you add to that with the comparison level, right? And you try to start to compare. And that's about age four. This is the time when you and other kids, you know, start asking the question why the sky is blue and stuff like that, right? And people go like, what's that? Well, uh, when we are a manufacturer, you know, in the, in the ballet or the reverse or whatever you call it, in the mother, the brain starts a development cycle. So at age four, it starts to kick in more and more. That's when you start out, because then you understand you are not the same as your, your environment. You are not your parents, you're not your friends, you're not your dog or stairs and all that. So you start to ask the question, of who, who are you in this kind of, what is your place in this you know, world or environment? And uh, the education we have is not about that in school. The school is about learning the facts, the numbers, and how to behave in the society. Because if you don't behave that way in the society, they're going to kick your ass and put you in jail or something like that, or make you move to another country or something like that. Uh, I would like to move to another planet, but that's not the case uh, as far, because the NASA is not doing, you know, the Star Trek inventions of, uh, you know, uh, traveling or something like that. It's, it's a bit away. Unless the Stargate project is actually real and they are actually, you know, using and the Cheyenne Mountain, some Stargate operations to travel to other planets. But if the TV show is anything to do, they cancel that, so I don't know. I wonder what happened to the Stargate. Anyway, um, if you're not into science fiction and fantasy and all that stuff, uh, you're gonna have trouble with my talk. But it's okay. I mean, you know, life is what it is. We have to adapt, right? That's what the brain and the body does. When you put pressure on the shoulder, the body adapts to the pain. And your brain is manufactured through evolution to be more aware about pain and stuff that doesn't work. That's how you get trained in, 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 through evolution. You survive to the tiger, you survive the savanna, you survive hunger, you know, all the strong people who, you know, become aware of their environment and what doesn't do not work, those who survive. That's how our brain and, you know, evolution and progress. The other evolution that people, you know, intend in the religious circles, I, I don't buy that one, by the way. Just, you know, my stance on that, my position on that, right? Uh, so, this is when, when you talk about, you know, what, what I'm trying to do and teach people to do is to become aware of, you know, it's not an unconscious mind in there, it's something else. It's something about the function of your brain and how you use that kind of functions into producing the thing. And that's all about focus of attention, focus of attention, becoming aware of what you're doing. So I'm asking people about the future, right? and they go like, yeah. Uh, so some people ask me, how do you know this is working for, for the individual, the client or yourself, right? You don't have any comparison going on there. People go like, what do you mean? Well, most people have a reality, and they go like, yeah. So can they define the reality they have? People can't do that because when you have a reality, you don't have any comparison about that. Until you read a book, watch a tape, walk, go to a workshop, uh, go on a vacation in another country, and you find out that they do things differently in that culture than they do in your own. And you go like, what? That's really strange. 
why is everybody in the UK going on to you know the pub on the evening? And they go like, what do you mean? That's what we do. We're English. We go to the pub in every evening. We have a beer with, and that's the way they interact socially with any class. It can be a nobleman, a royal. It can be a hardworking blue class color, you know, uh, coal mine, you know, guy, student. Anyone can interact on the pub with anyone. That's the UK social, you know, networking code. Uh, in Sweden, that does, thing doesn't work that way, and it probably doesn't work that way in other countries also. But when I ask people about that who lives in the country, they go like, "What do you mean? That's what we do," because they have no comparison, to anything different. That's the English way. So that's what happens when you have some, you know, a position in your life you don't have any comparison because the experience is iconic. There is no comparison going on. That's how you know. So what, what I'm doing in, a, in RBIM system is to teach people how to create a future, imagine uh, a better world for themselves, perfect days and having, a, you know, perfect stuff going on in their experience. I don't mean that, you know, they win the lotto every Saturday or Sunday, whatever, in whatever country you live in. You buy a ticket and you win. Oh, yeah, again and again and again. That becomes boring sooner or later. People go, winning all the time, can they become boring? And I say, yeah, I think they could be boring. If you're really successful in your in the show business, for example, a lot of those people, when they have all the success and all the stuff, become religious. They go into Kabbalah, for example, like Madonna did. There's a lot of, you know, and a lot of those people who are really successful find out their meaning in the life, or the extension of life, or whatever they call it, lacks meaning. Or, there has to be something else to the world because you know they have all the success, they have everything, but still lacking something. What's going on? Well, the brain, or what we call consciousness, that's what's going on. Because the brain is made for us to evolve or continuously do something. Because if people don't do anything, they get bored or you know, flattened or whatever. So, so we, we need to do something all the time. That's how our brain works, because it's always creating scenarios about the future or something. And if you don't feel that kind of, you know, you don't get anywhere. So we have to be become aware of when the, when the good, bad, or pain, right, wrong, and all that stuff. It's not about bad. That's a comparison, right? We talk about something else. We talk about how I, if I have this kind of day when it just works for me, okay? And I'm not well. Yes, yes, you know, uh, I'm really tired most of the times of the day. My body works, but the brain goes slow, right? Because I have a illness since 12 years old, uh, since 12 years. And that, you know, kind of makes me really tired and not working at peak efficiency, if you like. So I have to adapt to that in some way so I can, you know, function in the, in the world. So I can do things, uh, but it's it's so bad for me. So I can't, you know, do work and all that because it takes a lot of stress and toll on my blog. So I do this and stuff. I'm writing on a blog and I'm talking to you here in you know, this kind of format. It's not the ideal, all right. I at least you get a glimpse of it. I can do some, uh, maybe do some demos later on with uh, what I'm doing in the world. But anyway, I focus people's uh, attention on the future when it works. That's n number one, right? Focus on the money bar, and go like, okay. And it's not real, because it can't be real, because you don't have the experience, right? Or they, you can, you know, oh, well, I can't have that, because it's, you know, it's not possible for me, right? It's a kind of identity, reference, you know, it's not for me, you know, because that's, you know, totally too utopia. And I go like, okay, let's talk about that for a while. And I go like, okay. So what happens when you focus on that? And I go like, well, and sooner or later, when they do that, something will happen. If you do it the way I do it, elicitation. I'm not doing the elicitation the Helmut way, the neuro linguistic program, stuff like that, you know. No, I don't do that. Because in the neuro linguistic, pro, neuro -linguistic programming, they can't see this, what I'm trying to teach people to do. And this is interesting. They can't see it. I was doing a workshop back in 2004 in Canada, and one guy that was trained by Richard Bandler, by the way, uh, told the, the, the guy I was working with, the, the student of the workshop, and contradicted the student. He's, the student said, I have that kind of experience now. 
and the guy who was an elite trainer under Richard Bowling, you no, know, he said uh, he, he didn't. And I was like, okay, that's kind of strange. And I said, I think he, he got it. And he, he said, yeah, I got it. And the guy who was an elite trainer under Richard Bowling said, no, you don't. So what's going on? Well, he's trained by Richard Bandit, who obviously couldn't train him to recognize this kind of, you know, experience and signal in the system and all that stuff. So I knew then that, you know, he couldn't do it. That, that's how I know. Richard Bandit couldn't do it. He can't teach, can teach people what I'm teaching people, or what Joseph Riggs is teaching people, or uh, what Roy Fraser did the one time teaching people. And Roy Fraser, by the way, was modeled by some, you know, animal peers who claimed they can do modeling. And they fucked that up. And don't take my word for it, it's someone else who said that. And the thing is, when you do modeling, uh, it's easy to do it if you do it in an LP way, uh, that people start to, you know, frame the filtering process. That's why Young Grinder is talking a lot about, you know, unconscious uptake and all that stuff. And that's pure bullshit, by the way. He doesn't have, have, have uh, another way to describe it. You can do modeling in a totally different way and it still works, and, you know. But, uh, of course, it's an issue with the filtering stuff, you know, preconception or prejudice and all that stuff. And this is how it works and all that. And you have to be able to, you know, forego that and, you know, be able to do it. Now, I tried to do that over the years. Um, it seems uh, I've been pretty good doing that. So that's why I'm doing, you know, RBIM at the moment. Uh, that's what it's called right now. Maybe change in the future. Who knows? And I want you to be aware of, uh, you know, uh, that if you have your reality as it is right now, today and tomorrow, whatever, that you're in some way pre-planning it, that you can't change that because you're not aware of how you create the reality you have today because you don't aware, you're not aware of your own comparison because you don't have one in that kind of reality. Once you get that kind of comparison going on, you can start to go, oh, okay, I can't do that because that seems stupid. That's what people say, or that's crazy. Why would I do this, you know, this... Uh, people go, uh, and I tell people that, that uh, it's easy uh, to do things that you already do. But it's not that easy to start doing things that you don't do, or haven't done them. Because the brain doesn't like new things, because most people have associated or, you know, this because that's one of the functions of the brain. But it doesn't like when it's, because we like the comfort zone, we like the safety or whatever is going on, because that is a reference for our system to operate into. And as when I'm working with people, uh, I, I view that as a, as a training my students to do things to make sure you know, when you're working with someone from a different culture, one case I had a student who was from South America, or Portugal, or Portugal, something like that. She was raised in Portuguese language. She uh, been in, living in Sweden uh, 30, 40 years, I don't know, 30 years, 25 years, I don't know. I don't care about that, but anyway, so I sent uh, sent my student out to do an exercise, and this girl was working with her, and he came back, and she was really tired. She was like, she was totally exhausted. So she was energy drain. You talk about energy sometimes. People get tired, oh, I have no energy you know, today. And that's because you're there is still in the same context. If they've been working all day, or, oh, I got home, I need a beer, you know, I'm so tired. Change context inside. And tell all right. So they came into the room and I was like, what have you been doing? Why well, we did the exercise? No, you didn't do the exercise. Uh, because if you did the exercise, you wouldn't have, you know, have a different experience from this girl, this lady. So I asked them what they did, and she said, I was doing this, and I said, that's correct. But one thing you forget to do is that she's not Swedish. She was like, what do you mean? She talks Swedish. Yes, she talks Swedish. She doesn't look that sweet because she is, you know, have a Portuguese background. She had a Brazilian father, something like that. I don't know. Uh, that, that much information I don't need. And, and, and also what she was doing. So she was, what she was doing, she was digging, asking the question to elicit a, 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 her best experience of herself. That's what they were doing. They were trying to elicit this best experience for her. 
to get this, you know, wonderful, fantastic, right? did work with it because he was hammering her in the Swedish language. So, uh, this is why you have to always make sure when you do uh, whatever you do when you work with your information gathering. This is the key skill that, that people don't teach you. You have to do information gathering. You have to ask yourself the question, is there something about this individual that's not, you know, I don't know. And if they're, you know, did, did you grow up in Sweden? And she was like, no, I was born in Portugal, you know, in this country, and I speak Portuguese from this Okay. And I knew that about her. So I also come up on stage, and I said, I'm going to ask you a question in Swedish, but I want you to answer, uh, give me the answer in Portuguese. She was like, okay, can you do that? She was like, yeah, no problem with that. I answer your question in Swedish. She answered me back in Portuguese. After four or five of those, interactions, she was like, Phew. and she was just like a, you know, statue, she was like this clarity of, she was like, Phew. and the response by my students was like, whoa, what's going on? Because when I asked her the questions in Swedish and she answered me in Portuguese, that's her reference in her system, it's just not just the language, it's about, you know, the brain work tools and functions. Uh, Leon, all her impressions has been in Portuguese. The information she needed to have to get out of the context of Swedish, you know, was locked or stored or whatever you call it in the Portuguese language. So obviously some LP people might say, oh, that's the language thing. No, it's not. The language we use is also a question about focusing on the future they want to have. And then decide when the response is there, when they have shifted position. When she shifted position, boom, there was no difference than that. It was just, you know, very tonic experience. It was a pretty dramatic shift. Also. That's also, sometimes you have to do an exercise for, since I have a small group normally, so you can, you know, give them a comparison and make a difference about what to do and what not, what, to do and what not to do. And because people in NLP teach people to do things that doesn't work. And they tell you if it doesn't work, you do something else. And I go like, I don't teach people that. I will teach people to do this, and then it will always work. And people go like, can you teach people in NLP that always work? Yes. No one else can. Neither can reach a band or really stuff like that. Don't forget. Don't allow it. It's not why I just bring you. They can't do it. I can. Anyway. That's a... Uh, so a story for another day. So, so what is right and wrong and elicit the experience and all that? So what's going on? Well, obviously you have to connect your mind or the attention to what your body is doing in your brain and the function of that kind of stuff. And how you do that is to train your awareness of that. And I've been teaching people doing that, you know, elicit the response. One way of, you know, creating the iconic reference. And I recommend doing the interflow every day, so you can, you know, start doing things more fluidly. And if you're a girl, you can do, uh, you know, belly dancing and stuff like that. I know a girl in Stockholm, she's doing belly dancing and Zumba. <laughs> All that stuff. Really cool for those who are into that. And the thing here is, when you focus is on, on uh, two days ago I was on the uh, went to a haircut and I was really tired in the morning. I was really, you know. And so I decided to, you know, okay, I'm really tired, I'm aware of that, obviously. And uh, but I I'm, I'm not able to function, you know, I'm going to ha have a haircut and once I you know, shifted my focus of attention so I could be and after you know, a few minutes felt pretty good. And I didn't do, you know, elicitations and all that. I changed my focus of attention where it should be. And this has come back to, you know, if my shoulder is protecting me, if I strain my ankle, I will move my body. And the body adapts to that really, really fast. The muscles or the neurons in the muscles forms and adapts to that, so they lock in, more or less. If you're doing an interflow or mobility exercise like that, you're making sure the muscle can stay locked on. So you're retraining your, you know, muscle sensor because the brain, if I have pain here, it goes up to the brain and back. This is pain, I have to protect it. 
Yeah, the, the thing here is also the, pain, the, the body part that works also goes off to the brain and it works fine. I don't need to do anything. So what happens if I talk, start taking this kind of signal system that works and starting to focus more and more attention on that, the other side will respond to this working side if you start to focus your attention on it. If you don't do that, nothing will happen. So your focus on attention suddenly makes a difference. You don't need to believe me. I was working with a girl, she was multiple sclerosis. And she was, you know, going to a uh, uh, hospital every six months to test her balance, you know, she was standing on stuff like that and testing her balance. And every six months around there she got worse. A little bit, but not much, a little bit worse, a little bit worse. After six months, six months, six months, six months, right. Her indication, her pattern, she was become aware of when went to a first therapist in that case, she won't get, her balance got worse and worse and worse. When she went to come to see me, uh, she couldn't walk. She was like this all over, you know, the, she was having like four meters to, to walk. <laughs> it was amazing. She was like a drunk, you know. So I asked her about that while she was walking. Well, I had multiple MS, you know, and multiple sclerosis. And I thought, okay, well, why do you go walking like that? So I did some balancing issues with that, with that balancing, you know, upper system and all that. And um, after 40 minutes of that, she walked normally. She couldn't believe it. Neither could her son, who uh, had hired me. And I was like, you know, well, if you're teaching your, your body and your nervous system to respond by being aware of all of the pain, that doesn't lead anyone. Because the, the, the brain is, you know, the function, just function. So if you're going to make sure things start to work better, you have to become aware of the other side that works all right. So you can start doing more of that. The thing here is if you do that, you don't need to change the pain. Because that will go away. And people say to me, you know, you know, Robert, I, I, I find that interesting, all right? Yeah, okay, go on, okay. But, uh, so I don't need to change. And I say, no. But why? Well, if you focus your attention on the future that works, yeah? If you focus enough in the way I teach people to do that, sooner or later they start to change their experience internally because they have no, you know, comparison going on. I had this girl in the workshop, I was doing a listation of her new experience, and she had a new experience, she wasn't aware of it because she hadn't built the connections between her attention, cognitive, you know, awareness, and her body. And I've been uh, trying to solve that for about six, seven years. I was aware of that going on, and I couldn't talk to Richard Banner, John Green, they're just bringing all this up, because they don't know. No one else out there knows about it, as far as I know. And they couldn't explain it, because if I ask them a question, they go like, blah, 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 blah. And I go like, what? And I go like, ah, I don't understand that, because that's what I'm hearing. Maybe I have a hearing problem or something like that. Or maybe it's that they don't know, so you're trying to offer your metaphor to explain. And I go like, I don't, I'm, f I'm fond of metaphors in a way of, you know, relating to a subject and you can, you know, understand how to organize your information in some way. But if you, all the, if you teach it that all the time, people, you know, especially if you add in hypnosis and, you know, all the states of consciousness and all that stuff, people have no idea what's going on. And they can't, and you know, so I'm working a little bit different angle on that. So I'm telling people, okay, let's go for this, it's that. So I'm telling people, focus your attention on the future when it works. And I go, like, okay, it's not there, no one is going on. So if it was there, what will happen? I want to. So if I keep their attention on the future, something will happen. And it's predictable. It works 100% of the time. I understand my students when they try to do this, that they are, they are trying to do too much. And the one thing they always try to do as human beings, you try to understand what's going on. And I go like, <clears throat> if you meet a, a great girl, if they're a guy, talking to a guy, if you meet a great girl, and they go like, well, I'm gay, and I go like, okay, so if you meet a great guy, okay, I go like, or if they're a guy who's heterosexual, or, or if you're a girl and a lesbian, I, I mean, I can talk to lesbians, because they understand me. I like girls, I say, and they go like, hey, I do that too. 
And I go like, oh, cool. And they go like, yeah. So they have a you know, common you know, interest. So whatever. Uh, so talking to them, and you meet this girl, right? And they go like, yeah. So what's, what do you like about that? And they try to define it. Well, she's you know, uh, really nice there, and she's beautiful, or she has this, you know. And, but soon or later, they found out they can't define it. So they're acting on something they don't, you know, can't explain. But they still know what it is because they can feel it. And I go like, well, what you feel is, you know, well, how, how do I put it? It's this small thing that then creates scenarios in comparison because this is what we're trying to teach people to access this unknown thing we can't explain. And we are trying to teach people to access that and to, to do that. But since people try to understand it, they try to do two things at the same time. Two things at the same time. Go like this. That's the work that I learned. So sometimes people tell me, so when you learn what we'll do that, I just did it. I didn't ask uh, or try to understand. I just followed instructions. Right? And I found out when I was doing NLP, the instruction basically sucked. I went to, you know, the best in the world, Richard Bandler, Paul McKenna, you know, Michael Breen, and John Laval, best in the world. And I found out there were so many holes and gaps inside the system. And the human brain is like this. When you have a lot of holes and gaps, the brain starts to fill it in. Because they tell you this thing, we teach you to do what, and if you doesn't, if we teach you what doesn't work, you do something else. And I go, like, why don't you teach you that something that works already? And I go, well, that's not how it works. And I go, like, I think it can be working like that. So this is this is interesting for several reasons. I understand you or maybe someone will give a shit about that. How do I, you know, make my life work? Well, it's about attention in the future. Maybe attending my classes and maybe do a workshop or something else. I don't know. I have some students out there who do great work this week. Uh, I've been teaching uh, an English. Uh, I have Steve, for example, who is in New Zealand, Australia. He can teach you this. Uh, he would say he can't teach you, but if you go talk to him and visit him and have a coffee with him and have a beer, whatever choice of beverage, stuff like that, tea maybe, he can do it. He can teach you. But it's going to be too simple. That's the thing here. This is basically so simple. It's, it's a little thing you teach people and have this great result. But it's, it's a lot of lack of definition because the brain is like this. If you have given the information about things, your brain starts to rationalize it. It starts to have a reason for this information. And a lot of people can't, you know, stop themselves from doing that because they try to, you know, understand it while they try to, you know, have the experience. And I'm like, do you analyze your ice cream when you drink, uh, you eat that, or when you drink your coffee, do you analyze your coffee? Or a glass ice cream or food you eat? And they go like, oh, why no? Why should I do that? Well, this is the same thing. Why don't you have a future experience that works for you first? Then you can analyze it. And they go like, why should I do that? Because I want to understand what's just going on. And I go like, why? When you're eating food or ice cream, you don't do that. And they go like, well, that would be stupid. And I go like, I rest my case. Because that would be stupid. And for me, when I'm teaching and talking about this, most people tell me, and my students have told me over the years, it's, it's too simple. When you talk about this, it's too simple. But because that's, I make it simple. Sometimes, you know, when, you when I've been teaching and stuff, people go, come up to me and say, you know, Robert, you're teaching the same thing you talk about, you know, and write about in your blog. And I said, why would I do anything else? And they go, like, I don't know. And that kind of response started, got me, you know, asking a question is, is it so that other people, when they teach you things, don't teach you what they write about in the brochure, in the pamphlet, or, you know, information about the class? And they, I was like, Maybe that's it. Maybe people have been deluding and have this illusion about what they're doing and you know, teaching people. So they put that in the pamphlet. When the people attend the workshop, they go like, you know, this is not what the brochure promised me. But people adapt to that because maybe they misunderstood the message. 
And I said, no, you didn't, you didn't misunderstand it. That's what's going on in the world. I'm teaching you what I teach, write about in the blog. Or in my PDF about to the point or then to the point. That's what I'm teaching people. If I have someone comes in who is like this, like a popsicle, you know, they have no body awareness, you know, they're like stiff, you know, like a corpse or a zombie. <laughs> I obviously will start doing, you know, physical exercises with them. I think what I have very small movements, right? but they have to do that. Because they can't understand what I'm trying to teach them, because they can't have the experience, because they're really like this, right? Or if I have this, you know, dancing girl, maybe, or someone, you know, who has, like, smoothness of everything, I will not, I will maybe take a logical approach, or, you know, cognitive, and just focus on their representation, the whole album. And I'll teach them, because it's a mind-body connection. It's not split, or, I don't know about it. It's a mind-body connection. And you do what works. Like I'm not, I had a great time today. I'm going to end here because become aware of if you have a pain, you will be focusing on that. Don't. Focusing on that. And I know that's tough. But if you practice that with you a few times every day, if you have something, soon or later you will start to find that if you do that, the pain lessens. So you've been teaching yourself to have less pain. That's pretty cool. And the thing is, you didn't change it. You just focus your attention on something else. That's kind of cool. You don't need hypnosis or bypass operation to do that. You can learn to do that yourself. Mm. Kind of cool, I think. And in my program, I'm trying to teach people, you know, the approach of language awesomeness, you know, peak performance efficiency, stuff like that. You know, working at, you know, optimal, you know, workflow capacity, doing whatever needs to be done. And this uh, when I was teaching in, in Christine Persson in triathlon, she had this belief that she needed to be tired during the race. So she knew, she knew that she did her best. When I did my two sessions with her, she went to Turkey to run a two-hour race. It's, it's a lot. It's Olympic distance, shit long, you know. She was tired during the race because she was working with efficiency. She was like, you know, had this energy bump. And she was running and she was bicycling, she was swimming, you know, at the top of efficiency. She improved her time for the last year about nine minutes. And if you talk about with triathlon, that's impossible in any sport out there. Come talk to me if you want to do the impossible possible. Adidas commercial, I can do. Something like that, right? Anyway. I had to put some, you know, points of interest in that. And anyway, the thing here, when she shifted her context, went up to the hotel stairs, she became She couldn't almost walk. That's how efficiency, how efficient she had used her technique and physical capacity for triathlon. She improved her time for the previous year by nine minutes. That's not possible. Her improvements uh, in running for 10 kilometers, she shaved off minutes of the minutes of the coming years. She went from pretty good to attend a European Championship. She was almost going to the 2008 Olympic uh, Beijing you know, Games because she can get maximal potential out of the system. And I think that's pretty cool in any way. Because she taught her to focus on what works. When she was working at her peak efficiency, when she was, you know, swimming, bicycling, and running for an Olympic distance in triathlon. And I think that's, in many ways, a pretty good improvement, if you ask me. Are you there? Anyway, I'm just I'm trying to have some fun. And a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, when they go to a physiotherapist, you know, aware of the pain, okay, fix that, and they go and you work on that. And they go, like, why do you work on that? And they say, well, how do you pain? Oh, it's less now. And I go, like, oh, what's going on? Because most people don't know. I have people in my workshop who had tennis elbows, you know, pain in the elbow. And I did like five minutes work with them, it was gone. And it was like, what the hell is going on? Oh, can we work on the other side? And I go, like, yeah, okay, that's fine. They say, yeah, I know. We work on that for a few minutes, 
And then, you know, my attendance at Bobby's bad enough. And I go like, yes, I know. What's going on? Is it hypnosis? No, it's a directing your focus. Oh, yeah, that's also hypnosis or, you know, perception trap. But they, they also teach you that how much you think you focus on the right thing, probably not. That's why, you know, it helps by having someone with the experience like myself teach you do the impossible possible. And that's all for me for today. And whenever you think about the hero's journal, like becoming a hero or something like that, remember it's not about, you know, the great things about life or something. It's more about, you know, someone pushes you over the edge, like Luke Skywalker's family had to be killed before he could, you know, travel to the, you know, fun stuff with the rebels and all that, saving the galaxy and all that stuff. He couldn't go up if, if that... What do you think will happen if the parents hadn't done? It wasn't his real parents, but hey, would he have left them? Not likely. So sometimes you need to push over the edge so you can, you know, take action and all that stuff. And I'm telling you, if you start learning to focus in a way that, you know, I teach and teach in this kind of technology, it becomes a little bit too easy to do it. And too simple. Once you accept to do that that way, then transformation will happen.